Tonight, we're exploring the topic of dessert wines, and we're doing it with a Cellar Angel's favorite, Jack Seifrick from Cast Wines. We're going to go deep into cryo extraction, ice wines, and noble rot. This is really a fun episode. Thanks so much for all the support. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. This is SIP episode 78, and I am Martin Cody, co-founder of Cellar Angels. For those of you that don't know, or this may be your first time, Cellar Angels was founded in 2010 as a direct-to-consumer company, bypassing all of the normal channels to bring wines from Napa and Sonoma direct to you. And we have such a treat this evening that we are going to explore a topic which I'm shocked that we haven't explored yet in the SIP educational series, and that's late harvest wines. And typically we think of these in the cooler months, uh, winter months, after a meal, but there's often areas of the, of the world that have these after every meal. And so I want to figure out how to gravitate to that lifestyle. Uh, but tonight we have a very, very special guest, a dear friend who we love hosting. We love going to his property. Uh, it is behind me. It's a magical, magical place. And uh, I'm happy to introduce again, ladies and gentlemen, Jack Seifrick, proprietor of Cast Wines. Jack, how are you? Cheers, Martin. And it's good to be back with you and Denise. Hello to everyone. Hello to everyone is right. Uh, there is a bunch of topics on the table this evening, not the least of which is, in fact, the late harvest that we're going to talk about. But I find it interesting in doing research on late harvest, there's so many different types of of fortified wines, late harvest wines, ice wines, and that sort of thing. And not many people know that this actually became a thing in Bordeaux in Europe, you know, 400 or so years ago because of an accident. So, or, or maybe a freak of nature, if you will. So similar things happen to cast wines. So do you want to go into the story of, of how cast happened to produce this gorgeous bottle of late harvest called late sure. Uh, sure. Yeah. They, um, um, our our late uh, dessert wine was was really. It, I, I'd like to say we planned it, but sometimes you know the the best things in life are surprises. So the um, the 2017 harvest um, uh, came in. We had several different tanks of Zinfandel. Um, one of them just stubbornly wouldn't go dry. Um, it, you know, we we waited, we waited, we waited, and um, um, as a matter of fact, in um, the summer of, of 2019, um, the, the wine is still in barrels. It's still just a little bit sweet. And we hired a new winemaker, Ashley Hersberg, um, who you and I have talked about uh, in previous episodes. And, um, and um, you know, I said, you know, what, what, do, you, what do you think we, we should do with this? It was too sweet to, uh, to bottle. And um, she took a little taste of it. And she knows I know. Ex she goes, I know exactly what we need to do with this. And you know, within within two weeks, we are tasting samples of different ports. Um, it's a tough job, but someone had to do it. And um, you know, we tasted probably 15 different ports from all over the world, um, tawny style, ruby style, um, and we we kind of narrowed down kind of what we would want to do. And a couple of weeks later, we're we're tasting all these um, all these um, uh, fortified um, basically brandies, and um, and and ended up uh, ended up coming up with a blend where we put a little bit of, of of brandy into the into the wine and generated this port. So um, it was um, it was certainly as you're fond of saying, um, you know, lemon lemonade from lemons. I mean, it's just uh, um, uh, delightful wine. Um, um, we had plenty of time to get creative with the packaging, so we have a cute little uh, fairy bottle, and um, it's been it's been a wonderful wine for us. Our 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 desire was to have um, more of a ruby style, which which means a little bit more fruit forward, a little bit. Wait, more don't 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 tell people what it means. That might be a poll question later on. Okay, 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 okay. Uh. Let me ask you this though, because you, you started out with the 2017 Watson Zinfandel, which is one of your flagship Zins. And right. you mentioned that it wouldn't get dry and it was just staying sweet in barrel. And then you're, you're two years down the road and it still has too much sweetness on it. What, what causes that? You know, I wish I knew. Um, the, there's, there's just some, sometimes you get 
a, a, a batch of wine that that for whatever reason the the yeast kind of just give up and um you know you you most of the ferments we're doing these days are all native yeast fermentations um back in 2017 we we actually introduced we inoculated with some yeast to try to get this wine to go dry um and for whatever reason the chemistry just wouldn't allow that um okay. it didn't taste bad it just tasted sweet and um you know that I, I think the um um there's 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 various ways that you can deal with that some of them actually are detrimental to the ultimate product and so you know you don't want to be, kind of be careful because we had uh, we had um you know a, a significant investment in this wine and um uh, so we just you know i think i think the the solution that ashley came up with was was, was perfect it was brilliant so and, and Ashley was was new at the time. So was it more of a final interview question? What should we do with these barrels over here? Or was it she was already hired? And no, she, said, she, I, would, I, she would tell you that, um, you know, you go through you go through these processes. And, and you know, in our business, we're a 5000 case winery. Um, we have a founding winemaker, Mike Gouliash, who we were very happy with for years. He 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 retired. And so we are interviewing um, winemakers. And um, we settled in on a couple of ladies that we really liked. And, um, you know, it, at a certain point, it becomes as much you selling them as them selling you. And, and so you're, you're talking about the vineyards that, um, in Ashley's case, she's this gifted 38-year-old um, single mom. Um, she's got a great pedigree. Um, and, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about, you know, kind of some of the other things she's doing you know, we share her with a couple of other wineries and in both in both the, the Bocce Galupe family who we buy Pinot for, she makes a little uh, Pinot for their family. And then um, and then one other winery in Drag Creek, she makes wine for. And um, in both those situations, she's, she's dealing with um, all estate fruit. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but, but you know, she has a captive um, selection of grapes that she's always got to deal with. And right. in our winery, um, you know, I've always been very uh, much open to the idea that we're in one of the, um, the most um, uh, abundant uh, areas in the world in terms of a variety of different grapes growing around us, um, where we have world-class Pinot, world-class Chardonnay, world-class Cab, you know, uh, Zen, et cetera. And, um, and we, um, so we've always been very open to, um, you know, finding some fruit that just really kind of tickles us in a certain way. And, um, and so I think that was kind of one of the things that, um, that led her to agree to come to work with us. But, but no, it was, it was about two weeks afterward. We, we decided after she started, we tasted through every barrel in the cellar and said, okay, here's what we got. And I said, oh, by the way, <laughs> um, you know, we have this little issue. Um, and, you know, so, you know, not, you know, don't want to surprise you or anything, but, you know, let's, let's test your ability to solve a problem and um, right. he mastered the test, in my opinion. No, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of it. And it's, it's quite a fun wine to have as well. And the story behind it is terrific because it, you, know, you call it late for a variety of reasons, but not the typical reason that most people associate late harvest with. So I think there's four or five different elements. You know, it, it was a little bit late on the vine. It was late ripening. It was late fermentation. It was late in the bot. I mean, so all of it fits very well with the name. Who came yeah. up with that? Um, I think I did actually. It was just, it, it, you know, we're, we're just playing with, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's sometimes it's hard to embrace the idea that a mistake can lead to a good product. And you kind of want to, you know, people want to try to think that everything just always comes up roses. I think, I think the reality as you and I've talked about is that you know, we're in a business where mother nature has a pretty big say in how things go. And so we're constantly dealing with issues. I mean, just this, just this 21 harvest that we just ended, you know, it came in three weeks early, um, 10 weeks of grapes for us came in in four weeks. We were scrambling buying extra bins because we had no place to put the fruit and, and it came in 30 to 50% short. And so We've got all these issues we're dealing with this year that were completely different than the smoke and fire related issues we were dealing with last year that were completely different with the prior year, et cetera. And so the, the one thing I've learned now having gone through 10 harvests 
is you got to have a really open mind because you might have a business plan, but Mother Nature has her own, you know, edits. Right. And, so this, this yeah, you have a you have a rock solid business plan, and Mother Nature says, "Hold my beer. Uh, exactly. I'll show you." Yeah. Right. I do want to freshen up some people with regards to. Many of you are commenting in the chat that you are actually drinking this wine, and I'm sure there are other folks going, well, how do they have the wine? And one way is to go to the Cellar Angels website, cellarangels.com, and you will see a item there at the top called the SIP Kit. And the SIP Kit has the next four weeks of wines in it, and that way you can get the kit sent to you at home, and then you can sip along with the proprietor or the winemaker as we're doing this evening with Jack. And also there is a couple quiz questions that have money on them. And uh, unfortunately, the International Tempranillo Day was November 11th, yesterday Veterans Day, and no one, there was five submitted answers and no one got it correct. The grape is also known as Tinto Juarez and it's prominently blended in which fortified wine? The answer was port. I'm happy to say we had a late entry this evening as as far as the Sipster bonus round, the ferry on the cask wines 2017 late Ziffindale bottle represents indeed B the wine fairy that cast a spell on Jack and Anne and inspired the name cast. <laughs> so congratulations to Doug Rutherford. Doug, uh, you have to be present two weeks in a row to win the $100,000. So I apologize you missed last <laughs> week, uh, but this will all roll over next week, everyone. So it's fair game again. But 100K on the line next us. week. There's going to be a lot of money on the line next week. <laughs> Talk to us, Jack, about you, you and Ann visiting this property. It didn't look like this when you were there. So it did take a little bit of some vision to kind of dream up what this could become. Right. We, um, I think like a lot of people dialing in tonight, we, you know, we were, um, I wouldn't say frequent, but, but regular visitors to wine country from our home in Dallas, where we raised two daughters. Um, and um, we were on a, um, we were on a, uh, a wine trip, uh, 2011 harvest. Um, our, we had taken our youngest off to college. We had some friends that had, uh, that were part owners at Schramsberg over in Calistoga. We had um, been invited to a harvest uh, event there year after year and never could go because of, of kids stuff. And so we, uh, we said, let's do that. And so we're, here we are newly minted empty nesters, you know, riding our bikes around in wine country. And we start meeting people that, um, um, that that were in the wine business, and we just absolutely loved it. And um, uh, you know, a couple of months later, I'm out looking at property, and we thought maybe we'd buy a vineyard. Um, and um, I told a couple of my buddies in in Dallas uh, what we were doing, and they're like, "I'm in, I'm in." And so before we knew it, we um, by June of of 2012, so uh, you know, nine months later, we owned this property. It was wow. a residence. Um, on a planted vineyard, and um, so I had I had spent a career doing real estate development stuff. So I it was kind of in my uh, wheelhouse to uh, take it through a process of uh, entitling it and building uh, um, a, a winery. So we got we got our permits and we uh, we built what was phase one at the time, and we opened our small little winery um, um, Memorial Day weekend of 2014. And wow. Uh, We've since we've since added on. I think the the expansion project, which started right when the big fires hit in seventeen, got delayed for a while. But we've uh, uh, we've been operating now for a little over a year um, in uh, what what is currently our um, our facilities there on, in Dry Creek. And I was going to say I, I threw this map up a, a second ago, but tell folks where you are in relation to to Dry Creek in this area. So. The Dry Creek Valley is one of the little microclimates that, um, if you think of kind of Hillsburg as the hub, um, you have um, the Russian River Valley to the south, the Sonoma Coast out to the west, um, Alexander Valley due north. So you have you you know great Pinots and Shards um, in the Russian River and the Green Valley sub Appalachian out on the coast. You have um, people like Jordan and Silver Oak and all the big cab guys in Alexander and Knights Valley. Um, right. And then uh, Dry Creek is really kind of known for Zen, uh, Zen and Petit Syrah. It's a little bit of a warmer subclimate. Um, Ann and I live in a little town home, a block off the, scler uh, off the plaza in Hillsburg. And, um, and so we, we have this wonderful kind of confluence of all these great AVAs. 
I don't think there's another place in the world um, where you can find the variety of, of growing conditions and just superb uh, grapes um, uh, than you can in, in, in our area. I mean, I, I buy world-class Pinot and Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc and Cab, um, and, I, and I grow a world-class, uh, uh, I grow Zen and Petite in a world-class area. So, um, you know, that's what appealed to me about this area. Now it's, it's pretty, you're right. It's pretty special. It's almost like the four corners area in the United States, but it's just unbelievable wine regions where you can just yeah. walk very different close proximity and have access to world-class grapes. I mean, you can go to Napa, you can go to Bordeaux, you can go to Burgundy and you, you, you get a, a world-class experience in one thing. Um, and, um, I, I think what we offer on a human scale, a smaller scale is, is a, a, a much greater degree of variety. I completely agree. Jack mentioned earlier kind of a comparison and contrast between Ruby and Tawny port style wines. And those are two of the most popular fortified wines, uh, but not many people know the difference in them. So the difference, and this is our first poll question for the evening. And Mr. Rutherford, if you want to have a side wager of $50,000 since you attended half of last week's um, show, I'll be happy to, to wager that here. The difference between Ruby and Tawny port style wine is... Single choice, cost, production process, origin, color, and flavor. And because I know everyone is very quick on their cell phones, we'll make this a semi-speed round and we'll go pencils down in five, four, three, two, oh, rolling the dice, big money, one. Oh, there's a couple changes there at the end. So, Interesting, no one picked cost. I thought for certain someone would pick cost. Uh, but yes, the difference in fact is letter D or so. Number four, color and flavor. Uh, Jack was talking about rubies having a little bit more fruit forward on them, a little bit brighter color. And it's also because rubies are made in a much larger barrel. Uh, Tawny's take on, they're produced in a smaller barrel. So they have a lot more oxygen contact, a lot more wood contact. So they actually turn a little bit caramel in color. And that's one of your dead giveaways when you're tasting ports. Uh, production process is genuinely the same, but definitely uh, something worthwhile. And it's, there's all sorts of different late harvest wines. Are you interested, Jack, in exploring other ones besides what you're doing with late? I think so. I mean, I, um, I'll tell you, I was just on a, um, on a, on a trip through Florida for a charity wine event and we, we were visiting an account and um, somebody poured a um, Cabernet Franc ice wine from Canada for me. And it was absolutely delicious. Um, so, you know, I think one of the problem, one of the challenges in the wine business is we, it's, it's kind of like a kid in a candy store. I mean, we have our own winery. We have a winemaker that's gifted and brilliant and creative and flexible. And it's like, you can kind of get in trouble if you go into too many different directions at the same time. But, you know, on the other hand, um, it does give us the opportunity to experiment. And, you know, we, we have a whole um, um, little area of our winery that we call the Cast Creative Lab, where we do experimental things um, every year. And I, I could totally see doing, you know, um, um, what is it, the, cry, the cryo version yeah, of cryo, this wine. Cryo extraction, um, yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I'm, I'm very intrigued by all these different ways that you can take a simple grape and make something delicious out of it. So, uh, um, you know, this was, I won't say this was an accident, but this was a thoughtful resolution of an issue and, 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 it, and it produced a product that we're very proud of. Um, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't foreclose the idea that we would do it again in, in a different way. No, and I think it's great. Uh, Jeff is curious: was the Cabernet Franc ice wine that you were served was it from a company called Inniskillen? It was. Yep, yep. And it's it's funny. Ice wine is a, a tremendously arduous process. And I'm going to show some pictures. All of the pictures I'm going to show, unless I attribute them to someone else, are in fact from Inniskillen. And when Mission Control and I owned a wine store we used to pour and, and serve and sell the Inniskillen ice wine. But to give you an idea of a couple of different things as it relates to price acquisition, you have to be very dedicated to producing ice wine and your crew mm -hmm. has to be very dedicated because 
you've got to probably pay someone two or three times the labor rate to go out and pick at night when it's about 17 degrees and at day and night. So uh, this is a group getting ready. This is actually the Inniskillen property. Uh, so it's something that is near and dear to them. Uh, they do two different wineries up in Inniskillen. That one I think is fascinating. You also get to see what the grapes look like on the vine. Um, you know, no one would, would question the netting because the netting is actually to keep the birds away. Uh, otherwise the birds will pick a vineyard clean. Uh, it's like the finest dessert grapes in the world and the birds know it. Every bird in the county will come searching for that wine. <laughs> the other thing that's interesting as it relates to ice wine is the aspect of, well, not only ice wine, but noble rotten boitritis. And uh, that's a whole different ball game than ice wine. The, the, and Jack and I were just talking about the cryo extraction, because obviously, unless it's a very, very rare climatic condition, Jack's not going to have four inches of snow on the ground uh, with, and if he is, he's moving. Uh, yeah, if, I think uh, that would be a problem. <laughs> that would be a problem. But there are some methods that are becoming a little bit more popular in areas like Jack's. One of them is cryo extraction, where there's two different types of cryo extraction, and they're exposing the grapes and clusters to either liquid nitrogen or they have frozen chambers that the grapes pass through and it's fascinating because the berry freezes very quickly and there's a molecular cellular structure breakdown inside the cell of the berry that actually causes the grape expansion exposure and it dries up a lot of the the moisture and what's left is what they refer to as the nectar of the gods that sweet very minuscule amount of fluid which is why the ice wines come in the smaller 375 bottles. It takes a ton of grape clusters to squeeze out these little drops of, of nectar. And it's, it's not an inex inexpensive process. So I'll be interested to see kind of what the cryo extraction can do uh, and the economics behind it. it mm -hmm. from, a boy, from a boitritis standpoint, also referred to as noble rot, totally different scenario, totally different. Uh, methodology. This is where moisture comes in and there's actually a fungus and a mold on the grape cluster and it dries it out. Usually only occurs in, in kind of moist areas where there's moisture around like a river, for example, but this gives you an idea of what that drying out and mold and boitritis looks like. This is not from Inniskillen. Uh, this is from a, another winery up in Canada. I'm sorry, in France, but you can see the full ripe berry and it goes through this entire process of drying out and shrivels up and shrivels up and shrivels up until you get the final berry. So you can imagine this one has a little bit more fluid. This one doesn't have that much fluid, but what it does have is magical. So multiply that by a couple million berries and you have a case or two of ice wine, of, of boitritis, of noble rot, of sauterne. And, and you, Jack, have actually had the pleasure of going to sauterne. And, and yeah, we um, we did a we did a Bordeaux wine cruise uh, um, pre pre COVID um, and and spent a whole afternoon down in Sauternes. It's absolutely absolutely gorgeous and um, and um, a, a real treat. Uh, the, it's a, it's amazing that you can get such a beautiful, elegant beverage out of these rotten grapes, and um, it, was, it was just fascinating to me. And the the idea that you actually sit there as a owner of the vineyards and allow your fruit to 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 get to that condition on purpose is uh you know it's a, it's a new concept to us but um but uh the, res the results speak for themselves so they do and it's i agree with you T to me that would be just sitting on a razor's edge the entire time because you're yeah. watching your clusters accumulate this fungus and mold and if it goes too far you're, you're past and then right. you need you need perfect weather conditions you need the temperature to drop very very quickly you need a little bit of extended few days to get the the, the vines harvested i mean it is really a, a roll of the dice every single year yep but absolutely a, a, as you said the proof is in the pudding uh one final poll question before we actually can turn on some cameras Speaking of sauternes, uh, the most famous sauterne produced wine is from a chateau called Chateau de Kim. There are two grapes that comprise their wines. What are they? Marsan Roussan, Chardonnay Marsan, 
Grenache Blanc, Semillon, Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc. Now, this is definitely one I'm going to stop very quickly because I already see people reaching for their smartphones. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, there are three very, very smart individuals. Yep, pretty even. Uh, but yes, the two grapes for Chateau de Kim are Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, and they've been doing it, interestingly enough, and it's fascinating reads. I encourage everyone to just pull down as much information as you can on Chateau de Kim. I mean, they're now part of the LVMH portfolio, which gives them <laughs> unlimited access to capital to do whatever they want, pretty, pretty much. But they've been doing this since the late 1500s. And it's a pretty interesting thing. They do use two grapes. They have had 13 generations doing this. And in the 20th century, they've only missed nine vintages, where perhaps the like, as Jack said, you're sitting there as a winery owner watching all of this mold and, and rot accumulate on your clusters and all of a sudden it gets too moist and there's too much of it and you can't harvest it. But that's pretty interesting. Two grapes, only missed nine vintages and they've been doing this for 13 generations. So I, I strongly admit, or I would love to, I'm jealous of you, Jack. I was thinking about it today. I'm not certain I've ever even had to Kim. Yeah, I've, I've had it once. I, I, I would tell you a couple of things. I mean, that the... The fact that they make this wine is not because they chose to, it's because they happen to be in a part of the world where that's what happens to their grapes. Um, you know, just a couple of miles away in Grave, you have some of the best white wines of Bordeaux coming out of Chate, uh, Smith à Lafitte and Chevalier, and they're all um, um, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, um, Sauvignon um, blends as well. Um, but you know, they're, uh, Ikema is, is just in an, in, an, in an area where they where the the weather patterns and the fog um, and the moisture just create this condition um, where 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 things rot and um, and they've they've made the best of it. If 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 you uh, if you go there, there's some there's some wineries right around them where for a tenth of the cost of a bottle of Ikem, you can have something that is uh, almost identical. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm LVMH may sue me or something for saying that, but, um, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful little, it, it's, a, it's a great way to visit Bordeaux and spend an afternoon not drinking um, red wine um, and, um, and just trace something that is u uniquely theirs, you know, in all the world, these guys get it. Maybe Tokai and Hungary kind of has the, um, right, a little bit of that same condition, right? But but um, but it's it's just magical. It's it's really something. Well, and it's it's fascinating that you said you can go to that region, you can go to Sauternes, and you don't have to go to Dekem. You can go to a dozen or so neighbors that don't have the marketing power and advertisement dollars and those sorts of things, and taste wine. That I I agree with you a thousand percent. 99% of the population would be hard pressed in a blind tasting to tell the difference yeah. and, and, and a fraction of the cost. And it's kind of actually what Cellar Angels has prided itself on for the last 11 years. You can go spend all the money you want, or you can get very, very similar or almost identical quality for a fraction of the price from someone that just doesn't produce 20,000 cases. Yep. Uh, that is a perfect analogy. Denise is actually going to allow people to turn on their cameras and someone asked in the chat, uh, what glass are we drinking out of? Uh, I'm drinking out of, Jack's drinking out of the big boy glass. So you know, <laughs> uh, he's got a nice glass. I am drinking out of the Bottega del Vino port glass. And we are gonna be promoting Bottega del Vino next week, we'll have Robert Hall on. It, it is, in my opinion, I mean, it's a gorgeous glass. It's, it's a tiny little guy, uh, but we used to carry and sell stems in the wine store and we've had Riedel, we've had Waterford, we've had Schatz Weissel, we've had just about every stem and Bottega del Vino hands down was to Jack's point about De Kim, uh, you can spend a hundred dollars on a stem from Riedel. Uh, this stem is half that price. It is mouth blown, handmade out of Verona, Italy. You can slam it on a countertop, which Bob Robert Hall will do next week a couple of times and you can throw it in the dishwasher and there's some of the most elegant stems I've ever seen and certainly the most elegant that we sold in the store it was fantastic uh, so cameras are coming on which gives us a beautiful time to actually go to Google Earth 
I'm actually surprised no one prompted me for that. I'm a little bit disappointed. Everyone's a little slow on Friday. Um, Jack, while I'm pulling up, do me a favor and, and give me kind of an assessment flavor aromas profile of, of your late. Um, you know, it has a lot of this, um, the, the, a sim, it has a similar profile to, to our, to our Watson Old Vine Zinfandel. So it's got, it's got a little plum, it's got a little spice. Um, you know, we used, uh, uh, we used 191 proof, um, 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 a brandy to, to blend in part because um, we had tried 170, we had tried 180, but, um, but we, it, the, 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 the 191 really kind of came through pure and let the fruit shine through. And, you know, our, our goal, I have a, my, my wife and I kind of make all the decisions with our, with our female winemaker and, and not to be sexist, but the, but the, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of two to one in terms of if we're going to drink port, it needs to be equally compatible with a cheese plate or, 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 or dessert as with a cigar. And, um, you know, that kind of led us into this kind of more fruit forward um, uh, Ruby style um, that I, I think is, it, it kind of, it, it kind of is a little bit of uh, all things to all people in terms of what it can do. It's, a, it's only 18% alcohol. It's not, you know, it's not like some of these ports that are like, you know, cough syrup, syrup when they, right, when they exactly. Them. You know, you can't, you can't light it on fire and you know, those kind of things, but you know, that, that was our intention. And, and, uh, uh, so, um, you know, I, I, I think we pulled it off. Um, I, I'm I curious think so what other too. people taste. And I definitely want to hear what other people taste. I'm, I'm curious, and I'll come back to this in a minute when you said you can't light it on fire, that almost makes me think, maybe you tried or was there some <laughs> sort of an experiment there no. jack and i jack and i talked about sauternes and I'm, I'm starting google earth off on this show uh with europe right in front of us and so so let's go into sauternes and, and you can see when we did our bordeaux segment four or five months ago obviously we all recognize the Gironde river and, and Sauternes is way down the river. You actually have the city of Bordeaux right here. And when we look at these great wineries like Mouton, Margot, Hope Rion, you know, they're all further downstream, if you will. Sauternes is, is right in here. We did, in fact, talk about De Kim and, and Jack is correct. It's, it's in an area that is not too far away from the water. It's in a low lying area and the river is just off to the right over here. So this the weather patterns and the wind just bring that moisture over these vineyards. And, and this is where the winemaker and winery owner and family has to sit there and say, all right, let's see what the mold is going to do this year and, and, and hope that it doesn't grow too fast and you can't get the crop off or that it, it's not moist enough and it's a little bit leaner. Uh, but when you start pricing out to Kim, uh, it's crazy how consistently good it is. Uh, I'm a little bit concerned, you know, with the addition of LVMH because the same thing, in my opinion, happened to Vuv Clicquot Sparkling, where it was a, a wonderful house, and then they became part of LVMH, and then pretty soon they're buying Chardonnay from everywhere to start producing to meet the demand. Uh, so there's any number of a dozen or more producers of late harvest boitritis wines here in this region that I think the Cellar Angels trip uh, is going to have to discover some of these. Now let's go back to a wine region of which we're familiar and hang on. I did this earlier in production and, and it's, it's aggressive. Much faster. So the wine region that we know and love, Napa and Sonoma, and I also did some checking with Google because if you remember, Google used to have county lines that divided Sonoma and Napa. Google has done away with those county lines, and I don't know why they did that, because they said it was a third party, allegedly, that wasn't keeping up the county lines. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know how often county lines change, so it's, it's interesting that that was Google's excuse, but this is the wine region, and we're very partial to it, because it's, it's uh, Jack just referenced it earlier, it's unlike anything in the world. So you have so much maritime influence, you have so many rivers that run through both valleys, you have lakes, you have, um, I, no, I, oh, ah, no, what's this body of water out here? Oh, San Pablo Bay. San Pablo Bay, jeez, first time in 10 years, I forgot about that. 
uh, and obviously the Pacific. But then you've got cast wines that you can't blame Jack for, for falling in love with this. So cast is right here. And you can see its proximity is not that far from the Pacific. And there's a large body of water over here. And then Russian River flowing right down through the valley here. And if we get a little bit closer to cast, it, it just is a little slice of heaven. And even closer still, which I know Jim Brubaker, Jeff and Jane Greasy had the pleasure of doing a little time ago within the last month, you can look right down into the tasting area. <laughs> this is just one tasting area. That, you're scaring me now. That, I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> that that's okay. You were you had a shirt on. Hang on. This is, this is some kind of security flaw. I don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> but the property is outstanding, gorgeous, and, and beautiful tasting vignettes all over the property. And so there's shade, there's indoors, there's outdoors, there's this gorgeous palm area with Adirondack chairs. And it really is something to behold. You sit down, you get immersed in this incredible view, and they come and take care of you and guide you through the portfolio uh, on whatever you would like to taste. So I can see, Jack, how, how this would cast a spell on you. It did. It's lovely. We, we were very blessed to have found it. And um, the, um, you know, the, uh, the upper Dry Creek Valley, that body of water you were talking about is Lake Sonoma. Um, you know, um, our area of the, of the valley is, uh, uh, is very narrow. So the, um, the opposing side of the valley is that much more dramatic and and all the vineyards over there. And um, it, 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 it kind of reminded us of Tuscany a little bit, just in terms of visually. But um, I have to say, we, when we saw this property, you know, the, the real estate deal guy in me, this was the first property we ever looked at. And I had to go out and look at like 50 other things that were for sale. And we came back and bought, and we came back and, and bought this property. But um, um, we haven't been disappointed. And we have a, we have a, um, a um, vineyard that we grow Zinfandel and Petit Syrah that was planted in 2000. So it's kind of in its prime right now. Um, and we make several wines, including, um, including this dessert wine. Um, we, and then, and then we have all these other neighbors that we, uh, that we buy fruit from to round out our portfolio. Well, you also have an extremely impressive sparkling program and, and that is delicious, but this is the type of view where if you have an afternoon tasting, you're going to want to probably cancel that because it's very difficult to leave here. So you're sitting at these <laughs> tables, uh, you're looking out over the vistas, you can sit up here in, in this area, and there's just a ton of different places to be seated, which oddly enough are all like COVID friendly, you, you know, by accident and slash design, uh, but it worked out perfectly. You don't have to sit right on top of anybody. You're not five deep in a tasting room, you're outdoor, you're, yeah. you're looking at this and it, it doesn't stink. Yeah. From day one, we wanted to have a, we wanted to have a casual seated experience and, um, and, and, you know, we needed to have a certain amount of people every, every week to be able to make it work, but we didn't want you to feel crowded. So a lot of our facility has a little tuck. There's probably 10 different areas on, on the facility where, um, where, you know, you can kind of feel like you have the whole place to yourself. And that, that was by design. And it just stupidly um, uh, works in a uh, socially distanced COVID world. So we're, we're fortunate yeah. about that. No, very fortunate. So you mentioned you're at 5,000 cases. Is there, what, what are the future aspirations other than living long enough to make certain the dream comes to reality and Anne doesn't just keep the house and you're on the street? Yeah, exactly. Um, we, you know, we have a permit to make up to 10,000 10, cases. I mean, we have a business plan to stay um, almost entirely direct to consumer to sell wine to individuals around the country um, and not and not get into the game of, of distributors and and uh, and grocery stores and wine shops, et cetera. Um, it's, it's, it's really a completely separate business and, and one we don't have any business in because we just don't have any economies of scale. I mean, I have across the street from me is Ferrari Carano. They make 800,000 cases a year. 
You know, right down the road from me is uh, Gallo. They make 50 million cases a year. You can imagine that their their economics are a little different than ours. So, you know, what what we have what we have to offer is um, in handcrafted wines um, in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a setting where you can see where the grapes are growing and you can see where the wines are make, made and, and, and you can meet the people that made them. And, um, and we, um, we're very fortunate to have great relationships with a lot of great growers and to be able to offer some variety. And uh, I need to wrap that all up and deliver it in a beautiful setting with, um, with some good Midwestern hospitality is, is kind of what we're, uh, we're all about. No, that's awesome. And it's, it, it is something that's kind of special. And every time we're in the region, we, we love stopping in. And even if you're not there, you're, you're sitting there talking with someone that is so exceptionally knowledgeable about the portfolio, the wines, the story, the people that when you are there, it's great because you have access to the owner. Uh, but when there's others there, it just lends you that intimate experience that makes the, the Sonoma region and specifically cast so special. So as uh Jeff and Jane have said, don't change the model. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's it's um it's something we really enjoy doing. It's uh, we can do it on uh, on a human scale, and um, you know, um, I I I have friends that that come out and want to go to Napa, and we'll go spend a half a day in Napa and have a lot of fun. Um, in general, Napa is just a little bit more of a commercialized scale, and and uh, you you don't have as much of a uh, an opportunity to kind of meet the principles in the business. So we, um, we, we, we like what we're doing and we like where we are. So. And everybody else that drinks them loves it. <laughs> awesome. An impromptu visit from apparently my brother of another we, we mother. Obviously have, we, 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 we actually are having a wine club event tonight. So we have some, some friends here. But. Have you, you know, we talked about cryo extraction and obviously another way to make fortified wines is through sun drying and Amarone does that. Have you ever thought about anything like that? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. <laughs> They're Have gone you, now. Mean, Apologize talked, for that. That's okay. Uh, we talked about cryo extraction as one way to make kind of a late harvest sweeter wines, but also Amarone does it by drying the grapes in the sun. Have you ever thought about anything like that? You know, I, I, I had a fantastic Amarone with a friend um, and, and heard the whole story. It sounded very intriguing for me. I mean, they actually they actually harvest the grapes and they set them out on stones and they and they and they basically bake them in the sun. And, Correct. Um, you know, and then and then they go through the process of of, uh, of crushing them and making wine out of them. It it sounds exotic to me. Um, um, I, I wouldn't put it past us to do any of those things, but um, <laughs> It's 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 um I and the, let's put it this way, Martin. If if we're closer to ten thousand cases a year and 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 humming, I'll do some things like that. <laughs> right. So, so so Jack's creative tasting lab is just going to be uh, a, a shed of just creative experience experiments going on. Yep, I like it. Yep. And so the I, I want to circle back to the sparkling. How did you decide to become or have a, a significant portion of the portfolio dedicated to sparkling? You, you've got a, a large, quote unquote, I don't even know if it's official Sabre program, but you do a lot of neat things with the sparkling. How'd that come about? You know, when we first opened, so we, I bought the property in 2012 and we opened in 14 and we only had, um, we only had three wines. We had a Sauvignon Blanc, a Zin and a Pinot. And I felt like that wasn't, that wasn't really enough to, to, to run a business. And, and some friends of mine introduced me to some people that were helping a lot of small wineries make uh, sparkling. And so we, we, uh, we kicked off a Blanc de Noir with their help. And um, I thought it, you know, I thought it would be kind of a, I don't know, 50 case a year kind of thing where we would just pour a greeting wine for people when they arrived. And mm. I was, you know, this is one of those cases where it's better to be lucky than smart because we're we're now we're now producing about almost a thousand cases a year of sparkling wine. We do um, we do uh, blanc de noir, blanc de blanc, uh, rosé from the Carneros region with different combinations mm. of pinot noir and chardonnay and a little pinot meunier. And then we actually in 2019 when Ashley joined us. We kicked off an estate sparkling program, and we literally last week bottled our 2019 vintage 
uh, Blanc de Noir and Rosé of Zinfandel sparkling which Whoa. is amazing to me. I mean, we actually, one of our creative lab wines last year, we took the base wine for the sparkling and bottled 25 cases of a white Zin. So essentially when you're making a sparkling rosé, you go out in the vineyard and, and pick when the grapes are only 15 bricks. You know, normally you're picking the, when the grapes are 23 or 24 bricks. Um, and you, you bring the fruit in, you immediately press it off, you get it off the skins, there's no color added. Um, and you and you ferment that, and then you and then you bottle it with a little yeast and a little a, a little extra sugar, and you end up doing a second ferment, and it becomes this beautiful uh, wine. Our our white Zin is only ten point eight alcohol. Um, you, you know, you'd be hard pressed to say it's not um, some other varietal that um, you just never dreamed that Zinfandel can be this elegant. So uh, it's it's fun for us. We're we're going to see if people uh, will like it. I think they will. Um, and um, so we have, um, at the moment, we have five sparkling wines. And we did, and we did three pet nats this year, which is a, a whole nother conversation about the ancestral way of making sparkling wine. Well, that literally was going to be my next question because Doug asked the question is, what is the difference between the two pet nats, not recognizing that you did three? Yeah. And so I'd be curious what the difference is between all three. First question. Second question, whose idea was it for pet nat? And third question, and I'll rehearse these and come back to you if, if we have too, too long of answers. Did you ever believe that you were going to be 20% of your portfolio would be sparkling? No, I never did. Um, but, you know, it's, um, it, it's, you know, we just happen to be lucky. I, like I said, um, the sparkling wine in my, my parents' generation, when we first got in the business, et cetera, was really kind of a uh, New Year's Eve and, and, and wedding kind of a thing. And, you know, today... Um, I don't know if it's generational or if it's just evolving palettes, but sparkling wine is now something that's a year round, um, you know, I like to say Wednesday night kind of thing. Um, and, um, you know, e e equally kind of up there with a wine that you would choose just to have dinner with. And um, so um, we got into Pet Nat because in the, during the pandemic in 2020, our winery was closed from, for all guests, but we were all still there. Um, cause we were, uh, thank goodness in California, uh, an essential business and, um, Correct. and, you know, you're an, and, you're an essential and business thing, in Illinois and Florida too. And been, been beneficial to all of you, because I know we shipped a lot of wine everywhere because everyone else was closed down and needed wine, um, um, to make it through the pandemic. But, um, but no, we, we sat down and said, okay, we have this facility. We've got this team, we've got this access to grapes. Okay. Now's the time where someone raised their hand and say, there's something I've always wanted to do but we've never had the time or, or the budget or whatever to do it, you know, let's do some experimentation. And, um, and so immediately um, our, our hospitality team got together with our, our winemaking team and they approached me. I didn't even know what a pet nat was. I, 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 so, you know, and if you don't know what a pet nat is, it's, it's essentially, it's the, it's the original way several thousand years ago that sparkling wine was discovered, which is, um, you, you bottle a wine, but it's not done fermenting and it finishes fermenting in the bottle. And when you open it, um, you know, abracadabra, there's, there's, there's CO2 in there and it's, it's fizzy. And, um, and it's, it's, um, it, you know, since, uh, then in champagne and, and other places, they've come up with the, what's called the traditional method, which is fully fermenting and then second, taking it through a, a very controlled second fermentation. But pet gnats um, have been coming back. They first started coming back in the Loire Valley about 15 years ago, um, where, you know, kind of creative experimental people were, were fooling around. And it's become a little bit of a cult thing. I didn't know about it, but um, um, they're very difficult to make. They're very difficult to make at scale because what you've got is this moving target. Um, so what we did in 2020 was, um, we had done a, um, a saunier of the, of the Pinot Noir where you bleed off some of the, uh, some of the juice out of the tank. Um, 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 and you, know, you end up with this remnant that normally is used for topping wine. And, um, and so Ashley said, well, this would make a perfect pet nat. And so we, we took it and we let it, um, it's all native, it's all natural. There's no fermentation. It's about the most natural wine you could, you could, you could do. We did a little bit of the, of the, of the 
bunch of Galupe Pinot, and we did a little bit of our of our Zinfandel, um, where we just had this remnant wine and we fermented it. And then you're 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 literally going out and measuring the the sugar content um, slash alcohol content as the ferment's going on, and you're trying to judge. What in our case it was when it gets down to one percent, one one gram of of uh, sugar, we want to bottle it, um, and that is what we guessed was the um, the the the, pr the appropriate time to do that. It's it's difficult and sometimes you miss it, sometimes you're a little too early, sometimes you're a little too late. Um, and, and so you end up with a little bit more or less fizziness and 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 carbonation. Um, and I'll tell you our 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 Pinot was wildly successful, very fruity, um, beautiful, you know, um, you do them with crown caps instead of corks. Um, right, which is fast the extra you need you need more control of the of the pressure than a cork can provide, but not as much that you need the whole you know, contraption with the the cage and everything. So um, so when you open a bottle of our pet Napino, you you, um, um, you you know it 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 pops nicely. Um, um, I'll tell you with our with our Zin, um, which um, so the pet Napino we called Let's Party because it's like a party in a bottle, and we have this whole <laughs> we have this whole kind of uh, Studio 54 rip on the label uh, that the you know the the creativity of the winemaking team was matched by the creativity of the marketing team um, and uh, and then we did this other one uh, a pet nat of Zen which we called uh, fearless and it's kind of an evil Knievel themed thing um, dealing with the kind of the Americana of Zinfandel being uniquely American and um, we I, in my estimation we bottled that just a tad too early because when you open a bottle of that. It's like a purple volcano that that erupts, and and you end up, you know, we had to put a disclaimer, little little warning thing in the box when we send it out to the people that subscribe to this because it was literally literally it had a lot of CO2. You know, we you bottle it a little too early, it keeps fermenting in there, and you get a little bit too build much buildup. But that's part of the kind of the nature of why it's a whole experimental program in the first place, and um, so that that's well, how I we think... ended up with with two of them, and then and then we really kind of perfected it. And and got some uh, Pinot from Carneros and um, and did a rosé um, that has been kind of a home run for us that we did at a little bit higher scale. Well, it's interesting because there's obviously such a thing as bottle variation, and I can't imagine that being more accurate than in Pet Not, where one bottle. I mean, you, like you said, it's still fermenting yeah. in the bottle. You know, and then and then you have the other variation, Martin, where where some people take a Pet Not and they'll disgorge it. So you know when you're when you're doing that final fermentation in the bottle, you've got live yeast converting um, sugar to alcohol, and those spent yeast create sediment. And so, you know, in in most sparkling wines, you invert the bottle and you let it settle, and you do the riddling, and then you freeze the neck, and you pop the the plug out, and you top it off with a dosage, and you have a nice clear pure bottle. Well, right. in the pet nat world, you're as often um, encountering a bottle that hasn't been disgorged. So our, um, our, our Zen was so explosive that we decided we'd lose about a third of it if we disgorged it. So we left it. And so you've got some sediment in that bottle. Now, Ashley, our winemakers, like that is like the worm in a bottle of tequila. That, you need to eat that. You need to, you need to drink that. You, know, you should embrace it. And it, it has a lot of nutrients in it and a lot of texture. And then, and then our, our Pinot, I'm, I'm seeing Jeff shaking his head. And, and our Pinot, we disgorged it and, and it's nice and clear and pure and, and, um, and elegant. And so it's just two different ways of doing it. Um, and you know, for us, it's 25 to 30, 40 cases, each of those things in a 5,000 case winery. So it's, you know, it's playful and it's fun. And, um, and um, it's, it's kind of what makes it fun to go to work every day is is being around creative people and giving them a little bit of a license to to exercise that creativity i think i think it's one of the things that sets us apart from uh, some of the other big guys i think and the alcohol levels in the pet knot you They're mentioned pretty low. i mean you're you're yeah. you're 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 um i think we're around 12 i don't have them in front of me i apologize i think we're 12 12 and a half percent well, that's amazing. That's incredible. And you mentioned that you said the white Zin was around 10 and a half. The white Zin's 10.8. I was just I pouring had, it. We had, I apologize for my, 
my friend, um, we we're having a wine club event here today. I, no, I, no apologies I'm a very necessary. bad scheduler, and uh, my wife usually keeps me under control. And in this case, I got out of her control, and I, I double booked myself. So she's carrying no, no. on a wine club event for us while I'm doing this. No apologies necessary. I've actually had spoiled milk with a higher alcohol content than 10.8. So uh, that's impressive. And we will we, let you for the release party, we paired it with oysters and it was absolutely amazing. I mean, there's a there's a time and place for all these wines and, you know, a, a 10.8 um, really high acid um, um, Zinfandel tends to do really well with some salty oysters. Yeah, you had me at oysters. Um, so yeah. that is fantastic. I do want to thank Jack, uh, who did overbook himself and managed to fly solo on this with the help of one guest impromptu. So uh, that was <laughs> always exciting. He and better have bought some wine tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there are available gift sets that Ivy has created on the Cellar Angels website. So for people that are looking for Thanksgiving items, Christmas items, by all means, check the Cellar Angels website. Uh, next week, as I mentioned, we've got Robert Hall from Bottega del Vino, wine stem manufacturer. And their phrase and slogan is pretty good. If the wine matters, so does the glass. And we used to do tastings in the store with Robert 10 plus years ago, and they are mesmerizing. So uh, you are in for a treat next week. Uh, if you have any questions, let us know, please. You can find all these videos on the YouTube channel, Sub subscribe so that when you miss a week, you get a notification that uh, there's a new video up and definitely feel free to give us a like a thumbs up or a comment because we want to hear from you. You guys are awesome. We do things in a way that we hope you like. And more importantly, we hope you tell others kind of the way the small wine producer produces wines. So without that, any further ado, I will let you all get back to your weekend Doug Rutherford, stay warm. Deborah, wonderful to see you. Everyone be good. Have fun. Stay safe, everyone. Cheers. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Denise. Thank you, Jack. Bye, Jack. Hope to see you all out in Sonoma.